I've been asked to lead your worship this morning, look uh, very much forward to joining with you as uh, fellow uh, believers, fellow saints and brothers and sisters of Jesus uh, in our worship. So we'll begin our worship uh, on page two of our service folder. We'll sing the hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy Amen. and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you formed the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. In our readings this morning, our first reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter of the Bible, in which the Apostle Paul explains love in great detail and urges us to, show, to receive God's love and to show love to other people. We read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, know all the mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give, give away everything I own, and if I give up my body that I may be burned but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not behave indecently. It is not selfish. It is not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never comes to an end. But if there are prophetic gifts, they will be done away with. If tongues, they will cease. If knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when that which is complete has come, that which is partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see indirectly using a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I was fully known. So now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Alleluia, we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Alleluia. The gospel for today is written in John chapter 13, beginning at verse 31. And John chapter 13 is where our sermon text for today comes also. Our sermon text and this reading take us to that few moments before Jesus suffered and died for our sins. Takes us to the upper room where Jesus celebrated the Passover for the last time with his disciples and instituted the Lord's Supper. And after that time, um, Judas left the upper room. We read, after Judas left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. Dear children, I am going to be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you. Love one another, just as I have loved you. So also you are to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you, love, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We continue with the hymn, Glorious in Majesty. Thank you. 
I uh, begin the sermon today, I need to check on some technical uh, issues, and we're going to see if we have a screen full of something or other. And we are warming up, and I'm not that good at warming up a crowd. <laughs> So I will patiently, it's ready, okay. So I'm gonna, uh, you'll probably see mostly when to go to the next slide. If you don't go, I'll let you know. In the beginning, we're gonna talk about different kinds of feet. You will probably see that each one, each time I talk about a different kind of feet, then that is uh, time to advance the slide. So if you'll go to the very first slide, feet. What do you think of when you hear the word feet? Maybe you think of stinky feet like these. Or maybe you think of long feet or short feet or don't remember the next feet, which are beautiful feet. In our sermon text today, feet play an important role. In fact, the kind of feet that are important in our sermon text today are dirty feet. Okay, so our sermon text today takes us back, as I said before, to Maundy Thursday, when Jesus and his disciples are going to celebrate the Passover together. And they had a problem. So Jesus had sent his disciples ahead of him to, um, when I do that, you're awesome, uh, sent his disciples ahead in order to uh, get a room where they would celebrate the Passover and to prepare the Passover as is needed. Now, it just so happens that in the days of Jesus, feet were kind of a problem. People didn't wear shoes, they weren't invented yet, and of course they didn't wear socks. They most often went barefoot or they wore sandals, which isn't by itself a problem, except that there were no sidewalks, no paved roads or walkways, all you had to walk on was dirty old dirt. Maybe dusty dirt, maybe muddy dirt, but definitely dirty dirt. And so when you arrived home or arrived at wherever it was you were going, you had to do something. Now, most quite often, there would be a family slave or a slave that would wash your feet for you. And if you didn't have a slave, then you had to do it all by yourself. Well, when... Jesus had his disciples prepare for the Lord's Supper, for the Passover. They did everything. A man provided a room for them. By the way, when we were in Palestine, we went to the room where supposedly they celebrated the Passover together. It's quite small. I expected it to be larger. But this room was uh, uh, given them to use by a man whom was moved by Jesus and by his command to set up the room for them to celebrate the Passover. Perhaps he rented the room out normally. But the, he may well have provided all of the food, the meat, the bread, the wine. Um, but the one thing he didn't provide apparently was slaves to serve the meal because it was assumed they would serve the meal themselves. And so when the disciples came later to the room to celebrate the Passover, they had a problem. Everybody's feet was dirty, but they didn't have somebody to wash their feet. So now either they had to each wash their own, or as quite happened, often apparently happened in a group, somebody in the group would be designated to wash the, their feet for them. Well, it turns out that this was the problem. And you'll see, by the way, in my outline that I fill in the words for you. You have an outline in your bulletin of my sermon, but there are words missing. Is the outline there? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. And I'm giving you the answers. Now, in our congregation in, in San Jose, students, elementary students, have to fill that in, which shows that they were at church on, on, on Sunday. So Luke tells us, now our text comes from John, but Luke tells us that the disciples were arguing. They were arguing about who was the greatest among them. 
that's funny. You know, how do you think that went? It could have gone something like this. Peter and Andrew claim we were here from the very beginning. We were his first disciples. Certainly it isn't our job to wash people's feet. Um, John might have said, you know what? I'm a learned person. I'm a man of letters. I can write really well. It's beneath my dignity to wash everybody's feet. And maybe they all had their own argument, or maybe they also pointed their fingers at Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, the lowest of low people in their society. Matthew, you should be washing uh, the disciples' feet. But just at that time, Jesus had a solution. We're going to read now our sermon text. And you'll, know, you'll see how to page through that, okay? It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simeon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Well, <laughs> the disciples we're still arguing over who was the greatest when Jesus offered a solution to the problem. He got up, put on a really, must have been a very large towel around his waist, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Can you imagine the disciples' response? They must have been humiliated. Here was their master taking the role of a slave, of servant a role that they, his uh, students, had refused to take on themselves. I would guess that all that argument stopped just like that, and it was quiet, until Jesus got to Peter. Now, if you look at the sermon text in your, in your service folder, you'll see what Peter said when Jesus came to him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? It would appear that Peter was basically saying, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my master. How can I possibly have you wash my feet as a servant? Does that remind you of something? Something that John the Baptist said three years earlier? When Jesus came and asked him to baptize Jesus, and he said, Lord, I shouldn't baptize you. You should baptize me. I don't deserve even to untie your sandals. And so Peter, in good faith, asked Jesus, 
how could I possibly be the one who, uh, you, how could you be the one who washes my feet? And then Jesus made a really cool move. He takes the physical action of washing feet and he turns it into a parable. In this parable, there's an earthly element, washing feet, but there's a heavenly element too, washing our sins away through his suffering, death, and resurrection. And so he talks about both, but he doesn't say, oh, now I'm talking about feet, now I'm talking about sins. And so his response to Peter was this. You do, and he was, now he's talking about washing sins away, not washing feet. He says, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter, he said, you don't understand that in the next few hours, I will make the payment for your sins that enables my father to say your sins have been washed away completely and you are clean of all sin, of all guilt, and of all shame. Peter didn't get it. He still thinks Jesus is talking about washing his feet. And so he, he continues to talk and, uh, and says, no, you shall never wash my feet. Well, Jesus, again, talked about watching Peter's sins away, and he says, Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. And Jesus is saying with this, unless I cleanse you of all your sins, unless I wash away all your sins, we can't have anything in common. Because you're, you'll be a, still be a sinner, and I will be holy and perfect, and we can't be together. But if I wash away your sins, well, now we have this in common. We are both holy. We are both perfect. We are brothers. Well, Peter still didn't get that. So Jesus drove his, uh, uh, rather, um, yes, Jesus' next words drove his point home. He said, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. Now, in the parable, as we call it, it makes sense. If you have a bath, you're all clean. And if you walk outside barefoot and come back in, in order to be fully clean again, all you have to do is wash your feet. But Jesus was speaking about spiritual cleansing. And so he said, if you've been cleansed by my blood, you are completely clean. But then if your feet get dirty, you only need to wash your feet again. And what he's saying is, when I forgive you your sin, you're completely forgiven. All sins, every sin, everything you ever did, anything you're doing right now, anything you do in the future has already been forgiven. I love that message of the Bible. That's what I like to talk to people about. And that's the message that has brought us to faith and keeps us in faith. So if I forgive your sins, you are totally clean. Now, there is a slight problem, and that is that if I asked God yesterday to forgive my sins last night when I went to bed, and I had God's assurance, Jesus' assurance, yes, I forgive you your sins, you're all forgiven, you're completely clean. But when I'm driving down, or driving up from San Jose to Vallejo, I, maybe I'm thinking thoughts that are correct. They're sinful, whatever they might be. Now, those sins have already been washed away, but they make me feel guilty. They make me realize I'm still a sinner. And so, one of the greatest things that happened this morning is coming here. Because in our service, what did we do? The very first thing we did was we said, we confess our sins. And we heard the pastor say, on behalf of Jesus Christ, and I forgive your sins. That's the foot washing. It's not that they haven't been forgiven before. They've all been forgiven. But I need the reassurance. Because I sinned again today. I'd like to hear Jesus tell me, yeah, 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 Dave. I forgave your sins for today, too. And so each day, almost each moment, I need that foot washing. I need that reassurance that indeed my sins have been forgiven by Jesus because of what he has done. Wow, what an amazing parable Jesus has told. So the next question is applying that to ourselves. 
Jesus humbled themselves, himself with the disciples. How can we become humble like he is and he was? The answer is kind of easy. When I was finished with my sermon, I'd go online and see, maybe there's some thoughts up there that somebody else had that were, I might want to use. And there was one. This guy wrote, said, humility is not something you can create yourself. Humility is a gift from God, and that's definitely true. Just like faith is God's gift to us, so humility is God's gift to us. God gives us humility. When in his word, we see what an almighty God is, and yet, despite his being almighty and me being a sinner, he cares about me, that makes me feel humble uh, in front of him. Or if I look at what Jesus did, and the Bible says that he was God. He didn't have to change anything. You just keep on being God if you wanted to, but because of you. He loved you so much so that God, the Son of God, cared about you, each one of you. That's humbling. And that's how God creates humility in us. So it's important that we continue to come and hear his word in our worship service, to attend Bible class where we can have our faith strengthened and where we can have our our humility grow. Well, but Jesus wanted also to teach his disciples what love does. So we saw what love is, now what does love do? And we see in the, our sermon text that Jesus taught a Passover dinner lesson. Maybe it seems like Jesus' lesson is that we should wash each other's feet. He said, do what I've done, right? But he used some important words when he told them that. Did you look at, notice the first words in our text? Look at them now. It was just before the Passover festival. The next two words. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Next two words. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, Jesus knew what was going to happen later that night. And all the next day on Friday when he's in front of two religious courts and two civil courts, and he's beaten and, and uh, uh, made fun of and spit on and have a crown of thorns hammered into his head and strip him of his clothes. Such a humbling thing. Naked Jesus on the way carrying his own cross. Or they would put nails to his hands and feet, poke a spear into his side, be totally forsaken by God on the cross so that he could uh, earn the, uh, the forgiveness of sins for us. Jesus knew, and yet he went ahead. Now, Jesus knew while he was with his disciples in the upper room, he knew what was going to happen that night. He knew what was going to happen the next day. And so what do you think was on his mind? What do you think is on the mind of a convicted killer who's about to be executed? What's he thinking about? What's on the mind of somebody who's almost at the end of his life? Dennis, one of our members at Apostles in San Jose, just recently discovered that he has stage four cancer. No indication at all, but now he knows that he's facing his death. What do you think he's thinking about? So what do you think Jesus was thinking about? All that suffering that he had to do? Do you think he was stealing himself to be ready to take that punishment? No. He was thinking about the disciples. That's how much love he had. Facing all of this suffering, he was thinking and cared about his disciples. And you know, at that same time, Jesus was thinking about some other people. Just thinking about you. He said, I'm going to go through with this because I know that I have some wonderful people in Vallejo, California who are going to need this. They're going to need to hear that their sins have been forgiven. So I'm going to go and suffer and die 
so that they too can have that reassurance. That's the kind of humility Jesus wants us to show to other people. But a lesson learned is no good if it's not also a lesson practiced. So we're going to see in this Passover the action that Jesus took. Jesus said, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You should do the kinds of things to other people like I have done for you in washing your feet and, your, and washing your sins. But in washing their feet, Jesus didn't say do this like he did a little later when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And he said do this. He wanted them to do exactly what he had done. To take some unleavened bread. To bless it. And then to eat it. To take some wine. To bless it. And then to drink it. Because as we eat and as we drink, we're receiving the body and blood of Jesus. Now, with this washing of the feet, Jesus says, do this, but not in the same way, because he adds this word, this is an example for you. This is just an example of how you can show humble service to other people. I saw an interesting story that can make us think. Mother Teresa was once interviewed on a, an Arizona radio station, and the host of the program asked her, is there any, what, what, what can I possibly do for you, Mother Teresa? He was, I think, expecting her to request a, a contribution or to broadcast her needs for her uh, charities on his radio station and on his programs, more than just this one program. He wasn't ready for her answer. Instead, she replied, tomorrow morning, get up at 4 a.m. and go out onto the streets of Phoenix Find someone who believes that he is alone and convince him that he is not. Find somebody who feels alone and convince him that he is not. That's a tough task. How can we emulate Jesus who humbled himself? First, by condescending to become a human being because he was God, he didn't have to become a human. He who humbled himself further by washing his disciples' feet and finally humbled himself completely by taking our sins off our backs and putting them on himself so that we are now considered adopted children of his father. He's the one who made us brothers and sisters of himself. How can we create acts of Christian, humble Christian charity? In China, when we were at a large gathering, sitting around a large round table, and it was time for toast. When somebody toasted the guest of honor at that meal, they would show their respect and their honor for this person by holding their glass lower than the other glass when they clinked them. That was saying, I honor you as somebody more important or bigger than I am. So how can we show honor here in America on a daily basis? Well, being a parent can be a very humble job. Washing diapers, changing diapers, getting up in the middle of the night for feeding. Being a kind husband can be an act of humble service. The same with being a Christian wife. Letting someone ahead of you in line when they see you are in a uh, when you see they're in a hurry, that's an act of humble service. What's your reaction when somebody tries to cut in line, especially on the freeway? You know what I do? Sometimes they're parked over here behind my left rear tire, and I want to go over to that wing, and they don't move. So I just turn on my turn signal, and all of a sudden they're going to let me in, so they rush ahead, and now I have to move. So. You see what the natural reaction is for many or most or all of us? To keep that person from cutting into our line. Humble service says, go ahead. I can come one second behind you. That'll work. Middle school students, and maybe primary and high school students. There's a saying 
that people will always forget what you tell them, but they will never forget how you make them feel. That's true, isn't it? If a bully makes you feel worthless or makes you feel inferior and makes you angry, you'll feel that for a long time. But when somebody compliments you and tells you, wow, you have beautiful clothes on today. You really did well in class today. I really enjoyed the answers that you gave. That too, that feeling, no matter what they said, that feeling lasts forever. And so when the bully makes fun of you, what's your reaction? Your natural reaction is, I'm gonna get back at him right now. I'm gonna humble him humiliate him with what he just said. That's what we want to do. But Jesus says, I got something better for you. Tell him something like, you know, I make mistakes like that too. I understand. And now, no longer does he feel humiliated, he feels loved. We hope. Doesn't always happen, but that is what Jesus wants you to do. We can give humble service by donating blood, by volunteering at a local charity. We can humbly serve God with our offerings here at church that we use to support the work in our local church and in our Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. So one of the simplest and easiest ways, God and others, is by befriending other people. Just be a friend. People need friends. Or like Mother Teresa said, find somebody still lonely feels like they don't have any friends, and prove to them that you are their friend. That is what love does. Amen. Let's turn to page eight, and we will use the Nicene Creed. We profess, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer of the church on page 8. Lord of life, fill our hearts with joy this day, for you have risen and conquered the grave. Imprint the message of victory on our hearts and implant it in our minds. Through the good news of your resurrection, renew our hope and revive our faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By baptizing us into your name, you have connected us to your death and rising. You have put our sin to death and have given us a new life. Enable us each day to think of ourselves as dead to sin and alive to you, so that we may walk in newness of life in all we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this fallen world, Death and sorrow surround us. Touch the hearts of those who grieve the loss of a Christian they love. Direct their eyes to your empty tomb and erase their pain by reminding them that their loved ones will one day rise again. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, many people grieve without hope. Let the message of resurrection reach them and awaken faith in their hearts. Use us as your instruments to bring the word of life to their souls and the message of hope to their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Stay by the side of all who are suffering. In your wise mercy, heal those who are sick, receiving treatment for illness or recovering from illness or surgery or hurting in body or mind. We pray especially for the family of Sally Bailey who died on May 11th and for Al Linder and Rick Molesky who are currently diagnosed as having cancer. We ask, Lord, that you would give Sally's family comfort in knowing that she knew her Savior and she knew that he had risen from the dead and that he too, he will rise her too from the dead to live with him in glory forever. And we ask that you would reassure Alan Rick that all power is in your hands and that you have given surgeons and doctors many skills, medicines, and, and, and uh, kinds of surgery. We pray, Lord, that you will bring both of these men back to health again. And at the same time, we assure them that uh, life here is, all, is also very temporary and that life in heaven is without cancer, without sickness, without pain, without suffering, because we live our life with you in protection. Remind them that your victory over death is a fact and comfort them with your promise to raise them and give them and all believers new glorified bodies like yours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear us, Lord, as we now pray in silence. Risen Savior, feed our faith with the message of your resurrection. Come to us in your word and in the feast of your sacrament to sustain and strengthen us until we feast with you in eternal glory. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A reminder that Jesus teaches that celebrating the Lord's Supper together is a public expression of unity in our beliefs. We want you to, uh, we want you to celebrate and receive the Lord's Supper to be a blessing. Therefore, we ask that all visitors speak with our pastor before receiving the Lord's Supper. He would be happy to arrange a time to meet with you to explain our beliefs and establish our true unity. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up our hearts. Lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right to you. Please be seated. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Holy uh, Lord and Holy Father. Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us and grant us peace. Amen. give thanks almighty God that you have refreshed us with this holy supper we pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God now and forever Amen. the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 Christ is risen. He, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We sing our closing hymn.
That's good to see some of you for the second time, others for, we've been uh, together many times. Are there some announcements? There will be. Good, uh, and I'm ready for them. You are. Yeah. <laughs> good morning all, in morning. person and online. Uh, Pastor Voss, thank you for lovingly preparing the message of Christ's love for us and how we might show that love to others, emulating the ultimate demonstration of love. So thank you, and greetings to your wife, Andrea. Uh, back page of your bulletin has a whole raft of things coming up. Please be aware of them. A uh, One that I'd like to stress, and for those of you who are watching online, and there's a possibility that you could be here on um, May 22nd, that's a week from today, there will be the quarterly voters assembly and open forum uh, to, to discuss matters at hand as summarized on the back of the bulletin. So if at all possible, please plan to hang around for that. Um, on the calendar for this coming week, midweek Bible class online is Wednesday. We're, study, we're going through the, the online series, The Chosen, and we're coming to episode three, which is Jesus with the Children. Um, it's one of my favorite episodes. And um, as Pastor summarized in the uh, bulletin, what does Jesus mean to be chosen? You are cherished. And that's what we'll be looking at in that, that study that night, seven o'clock. Uh, also put on your calendars, June 12th, Congregational Barbecue and Picnic. And um, so scrape off your Weber and dust off your cookbook and we'll look forward to that. And uh, just a final note, I hadn't mentioned, but maybe you caught it in the sermon. I'm actually a member at Apostles Lutheran Church in San Jose. We actually live very close uh, there. I had been a pastor at uh, Peace in Santa Clara uh, for about 10 years. And so very familiar with that area. And of course, member here for probably 10 years too. Yeah. And so this is, I have many church homes, it seems. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. May God bless you. I'm not sure how does pastor dismiss, but one, oh, yes. One more announcement. Yeah, good. Please. I've got an announcement for the women. We have the LWMS um, election ballots. These are for the national um, officers. So if you could check in with me after the service and pick up a ballot. We need them returned by next Sunday so that we can get those sent in. Oh, okay, thank you. So I just go to the back. Thank you. <laughs> 